The Paris Agreement in 2015 saw almost every country on the planet commit to a rapid and dramatic decrease in global carbon dioxide emissions to avoid the worst consequences of human-induced climate change. A major part of that mission is to move away from fossil fuel-based power generation as quickly as possible using renewable energy sources like wind, solar, hydro and geothermal power, all connected to continent-wide distributed smart grids to ensure all that lovely green electricity is always available wherever and whenever it's needed. Transporting electrical energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed without losing too much of it through heat and other inefficiencies is one of the biggest challenges faced by grid operators around the world. Most grids use high voltages to provide enough push to allow the electricity to travel through the power lines over distances of several hundred miles. And when I say high voltage, I mean anything up to about 400,000 volts. But as the distances between electricity generation and consumption grow ever bigger, Transmission line power losses are becoming a growing problem. In 2019, as part of Xi Jinping's astonishingly ambitious Belt and Road Initiative, China's state grid corporation switched on a transmission system generating a mind-blowing 1.1 million volts using direct current to transmit the electricity down the power lines instead of the more commonly used alternating current. It's called the Shangji to Guquan project and it stretches more than 3,000 kilometres from the wind and solar farms of Xinjiang in the northwest all the way across to Anhui province in the east. And that's like Seattle to Chicago or London to Cairo. But the Chinese energy companies aren't just looking within their own country, they're also looking out towards the wider stretches of the Asian continent and beyond. In fact, they claim a system similar to this one could potentially send a direct electricity supply as far as Germany. So is this a master environmental plan to move China more rapidly towards a sustainable future or a ruthlessly aggressive step towards Chinese global energy domination? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. One of my favourite research websites is this one, called thetruesize.com. You can drag any country on the Mercator projection of the world onto any other country, and it scales it correctly so you can see a proper comparison. So if we drag the contiguous 48 states of America down to China, you find they're remarkably similar in size and shape. Unlike the states though, the western side of China is a barely inhabited no man's land mainly made up of desert, and that makes it an ideal location for enormous quantities of solar and wind power. In fact, China now has so much renewable power generation in the interior of their country that it often has to be switched off or curtailed because it can't be used in the regions where it's being produced. And according to this Bloomberg report, the Chinese National Energy Administration has banned the construction of new coal-fired plants in Xinjiang as well as 20 other provinces because of an expected overcapacity. That's where UHVDC transmission comes into play. The power lines of the Shangji to Guquan project can transmit 12 gigawatts and supply 66 billion kilowatt hours per year of electricity to eastern China. According to the China State Grid Corporation, that's enough to supply 50 million households and reduce coal use by more than 30 million tonnes. Most grids around the world use alternating current to send electricity down their power lines and that's because it's pretty easy to step up and step down the voltage of AC power by taking advantage of induction using a transformer, which is something we looked at in a recent video. Direct current doesn't cause induction so it doesn't work with transformers. But in AC power lines that same induction also causes quite significant energy losses along with some other inconvenient phenomena that are outside the scope of this video like phase displacement, capacitance and the fact that alternating current only conducts along the surface of the wire, something electrical experts call the skin effect. Direct current doesn't suffer from any of these losses, so if you're sending electricity over very long distances then direct current is way more efficient. So why haven't we just always used direct current? Well, when Thomas Edison first built his DC grid in Manhattan in 1882, there was no way of ramping up the voltage because there's no DC equivalent of an AC transformer. That meant he couldn't get the voltage high enough to send his power more than a few miles. As a result, the three-phase high-voltage AC transmission system being developed at the same time by Edison's arch-rival Nikola Tesla rapidly became the de facto standard around the world, even with all its transmission line losses. Modern electronic wizardry now makes it economically viable to achieve the best of both worlds for very long transmission distances by stepping up the voltage from AC power generators and converting that to DC power to send down the transmission lines more efficiently 
before converting it back into AC at the other end so that it can be stepped down again into a usable voltage. Once you factor in all the pros and cons, you get a cost-benefit analysis graph that looks a bit like this, with the break-even transmission distance between AC and DC coming out at somewhere around 600 kilometers. Ultra-high voltage DC transmission has clear environmental benefits just by reducing the amount of power lost in the transit, even if the power is being produced by fossil fuel. But the really big advantage is in minimising that curtailment of renewable energy sources that we talked about earlier. This study found that a UHV DC transmission line from Wyoming's wind farms to California could cut emissions by as much as 80%. In Germany, it would go a long way to eradicating the problems they currently have with getting power from the wind turbines in the north to the large industrial cities of the south. In China's case, at least according to the State Grid Corporation, implementation of UHV DC lines and minimization of containment times could save the equivalent of more than 50 million tonnes of CO2 emissions every year. Further afield though, there are some concerns about other knock-on environmental effects. As well as solar and wind, China already generates a huge amount of hydroelectric power from dozens of dams along the Mekong River, which starts in China and runs a full 4,000 kilometres through Myanmar, Laos, Thailand and Cambodia before reaching the sea in the south of Vietnam. Stemming the water flow for electrical power reduces the availability of water downstream, impacting 60 million people in the lower Mekong Basin countries, many of whom rely on the rich supply of fish in the Mekong for their livelihood, a supply that's been dwindling very badly in recent years. The risk is that a more efficient electricity transmission system will tempt China to develop yet more hydroelectric power stations further down the Mekong River system, extending their reach ever deeper into Asia as part of that Belt and Road Initiative. The global pandemic has of course taken its toll on the economies of every country in the world and China's no exception. According to this power technology report from May 2020, the Chinese economy contracted by 6.8% in the first quarter of the year. In response to that pressure, Xi Jinping's government decided that the country should accelerate investment in new infrastructure instead of signing off huge stimulus packages to big businesses in the way that many other countries have chosen to do. They claim that will mean a focus on projects that drive innovation and speed up the penetration of advanced technology in economically weaker areas. The seven priority infrastructures are 5G cellular networks, artificial intelligence, industrial internet of things, data centers, electric vehicle charging stations, intercity high speed rails and ultra high voltage transmission grids, with a target of no fewer than 14 new UHV projects worth about $27 billion in 2020. Not all of them span the vast distances of the Zhangji to Guquan project, so they won't all utilize DC current, but they'll all be between 800 and 1000 kilovolts using the gargantuan grid and transformer technologies supplied by European manufacturing giants Siemens and ABB. And they will all undoubtedly improve China's energy efficiency and carbon footprint. That unequivocal vote of confidence in UHV technology from the Chinese government has reinvigorated the developers of unfinished wind and solar projects as they realise the positive implications for their operational revenues that reductions in curtailments will bring in the future. According to the Power Technology article, the Chinese State Power Investment Corporation plans to develop about 300 projects in 2020 with a total size of $14.5 billion, 90% of which will be in clean energy like solar and new green technologies like EV charging stations and hydrogen. To encourage these infrastructure investments, the government says it will increase its bond issuances from $300 billion in 2019 to $420 billion in 2020, with 85% of that going into infrastructure improvements compared to only 25% in 2019. I'm sure we're all fully aware of the many deeply troubling aspects of the Chinese Communist Party's approach to governing 1.4 billion people and their sometimes completely baffling international diplomacy decisions in recent months. But their strategy for a green recovery from the ravages of COVID-19 does on the face of it look like a template that many other administrations around the world might do well to learn from. You may well have an entirely different view of course and that's why there's a free and unedited comments section below each of my videos. So jump down there and share your thoughts if you feel so inclined. That's it for this week though. A huge thank you to the channel's supporters over at Patreon. 
who keep the lights on and help maintain the channel's independence. And a special thank you to some new folks who've joined in the last couple of weeks with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Manny RS, Kelly Simmons, Doug Mackay, David Wilner, Jan Wolfson, Heather Sitz, Sebastian Nordstrom, Richard Waller, Corken, and Tim Gross. And of course, thanks to everyone else who's joined since last time. You can get involved with all of that by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can support the channel hugely and completely for free by subscribing and hitting the like button to persuade YouTube to share the videos with more people. And make sure you hit the little bell icon as well so you get notified of new content. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.